There's a lot of mystique around what hackers do. Um, you know, wearing hoodies and all sorts of dark stuff and motifs. But really, if you peel it back, it, it's pretty simple. Hackers in general are probing environments. They're looking at what customers people are exposing online, and then they're making inferences based on that, much like a detective would do. So they're gathering intel and they're connecting that intel. And they repeat that process until they get what they want, which is gonna be sensitive data. Um, they could be getting credentials, which will let them pivot and enumerate more. And that process just keeps going on indefinitely. And we've built our platform, Horizon 3 AI, basically on that model. All right. Hey, hey everybody. Good day, good morning, and good afternoon. I'm Monty Canode, the Director of Customer Success, and coming to you live from the Rocky Mountain Cyber Symposium out here in Colorado Springs, uh, where we have got a little over 2,000 people gathering up now that uh, some of the rates are going down. People are getting out, getting back together, and it's a good day to be a cyber uh, attacker out here in Colorado Springs. So I wanted to thank everybody for joining us on this new journey that we are starting here with a new series that we're gonna carry out throughout this year. And we're at, we called it Hacking with Horizon 3. This is the attacker's journey, which we're gonna show you very clearly is not too far off from a hero's journey. And so what we wanna do is Tony, one of the Greybeards, he's the CTO for Horizon 3. We're joined with Chris Pruitt, CTO at MRK Technologies and the new uh, noob, who is one of our front end engineers, Noah King, who we're going to be following his journey as an aspiring attacker throughout the coming year, where we've got some great special guests like Chris, who's going to be joining us uh, with a little bit of color commentary so that what we can do is start down this path and watch Noah, where he can talk about his call to adventure, where he started seeing, hey, this was pretty cool. And he's got some stories about some of the things he's starting to see as he has joined this company and wanted to understand, hey, what exactly is it we do? Because a lot of people want to understand, we talk about an attacker's perspective. We talk about understanding things from that flipping the map around so that you can see things differently. What exactly does that mean? And I think a lot of times people look at an attacker and they understand, they're like, oh man, I don't know how to hack. Well, that's what this is, is taking somebody who's been on the defensive, the dev side, and hey, what, what exactly is Noah seeing in that call to adventure when he looks at supernatural aid and he's looking at YouTube videos, hack the box, what he is going through and what some of these guardians, mentors, helpers like Tony and Chris and some of our attackers that are out there that are gonna be joining in future calls with us as Noah takes his first step to go down this path. And so what we're really doing is looking at this new hero. A lot of time you don't view an attacker as the hero. So that's what we wanna do is show how the attacker's perspective can be that new hero because it shows truth. And so this is what Tony's gonna to dig into a little bit is that call, the attacker's perspective. Then we're gonna hand it over to Chris as that initial gray beard who's going to help guide Noah along the way. And then you're gonna to get to see Noah tell some of his story and walk through his decisions on some of his first attacking. And he's gonna give you some incredible insight. So so, Tony, if you don't mind getting us started off on the right way, you handsome man, you, I can't wait to hear what you got. Thanks, Monty. Yeah, one of, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do with these tech talks was, uh, was to reveal behind the curtain of offensive security. It's wrapped in this black magic, this mystique, uh, and I, I wanted to provide a way for us as offensive security experts, defenders, and, and IT operations folks to share this knowledge because it will make everybody better. And it, it will help us really uh, approach our, uh, our look, how we look at our architectures, how we look at our code and understanding how attackers and offensive uh, bad actors, attackers, and even our friendly pen testers and red teamers, how they look at our infrastructures, our code, our OPSEC to, to inform two ideas. One is offense to inform defense. 
and the other is to inf- is, to, is the other idea is uh, defense defensible by design. And over the last two years, since you know, two and a half years now, since I started this company with Sneha, uh, I've been taking this survey on LinkedIn, and everybody who comes to me with a uh, defensive name in their title, I ask them a question. I only do like I get in trouble for not connecting with everybody, but I like to have meaningful connections on LinkedIn, um, and I always start the conversation with uh, folks who say they're in defense, and I ask them. I say. Um, I like to have meaningful conversations. Uh, so I usually start with a question. Here's the question. You say you're in defense. How much time would you say you meaningfully spend studying offensive security tools, tactics, techniques, uh, and, and practicing them? And out of hundreds and hundreds of these responses, only three, actually, I got four. I got another one the other day. Four people have said that as defenders, they only spend so much time, you know, any meaningful amount of time studying the offensive side. And I thought that was super interesting. Now, the flip side of that, anybody who has anything to do with DFIR or um, uh, offense, obviously, they're going to say, I study a whole lot about offensive security, but I ask them a different question. I ask them about how much time do you study defensive capabilities? What tools, what tactics are defenders using? And 100% of them say a whole lot. (laughs) I need to understand what I'm going to be working around. How are they going to be stopping me? And this dichotomy there is super interesting. And I wanted to reveal that through these tech talks and through the things that we're learning as we're building our product and doing all of that, bringing in partners such as Chris and MRK and their amazing team and helping us share all of that knowledge. And we're focusing these on practitioners, the SREs, the the uh, sysadmins, the network engineers, uh, the developers like Noah, to help them understand what is it that that an attacker is going to be looking at when they are attacking them and they are always attacking you. Uh, If over the last couple of decades, interconnectedness has made things significantly easier for us. Whole, bring a whole lot of convenience, not, not just for us as, as like people, but for us as engineers and developers. Look at how, and, and, and the reason I say that is we keep adding these layers of abstraction on top to make it simpler for us to develop new products, make it simpler for us to implement new technologies because they're built on these more complex layers. But if you look back, the lower layers don't get updated as often anymore. We're building in more security as we get, you know, as, as it gets more and more simplified for us. But there are things underneath, and those are the kind of the components that an attacker is also going to be looking at. Take Log4Shell, for instance. Log4Shell was based on a library that's been around for a really long time, and just everybody uses it, but it's lower in the stack and didn't have the same security rigor. We just know I need to do logging in my Java application. So I'm going to. I'm going to use Log4Shell or Log4J because that's what everybody uses. Um, Really understanding how threat actors look at the world helps us as practitioners to build and maintain more secure implementations. And it's not just because we understand how they're looking at it, but it's what they're doing is they have not only an understanding of how something works, but also how does this work and how does it interact and how does it improperly interact with things around it? And how can I, as an attacker, leverage that to get more information or extract value from whatever my target is? And we want to show you some of those things over this next series. So following Noah's story as a developer, um, a front-end developer at at Horizon 3, all the way from offsec curious to offsec aware, all the way to OSCP, I'm really excited about, you know, taking this journey with him and and helping him along the way. Um, and I hope that it will, will make it more approachable for our targeted audience. Um, and obviously, you guys know me, no sales, no marketing in here, really. Uh, this is about sharing our knowledge and helping uh, secure everybody's environments more. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's an amazing, amazing dude. And I'm really glad that you're here, brother. Go ahead. Glad uh, glad to be here. And uh, it's both with... Uh... I think great honor and great offense that I will uh, take the name Graybeard. Um, I've been in IT and IT security about 25 years, right? It's, uh, I don't know if it's from the career or my kids, 
Um, I've been in IT and IT security about 25 years. And um, uh, I, I would say on the other side of the fence, I know Tony and Monty have both been, uh, um, you know, spent the bulk of their career on the offensive side, um, primarily in uh, military. Um, I've been in uh, corporate America for most of my career being on the uh, defensive side of things. And you know, I, th I think interestingly, like what we're talking about here is what I've kind of built my career on. It's um, the curiosity of how the attackers operate. You know, I wanted to be play better defense. So what did I do? Go learn how offense was being performed, um, you know, er early on for, you know, identifying malware and tools on the phishing onto um, uh, credential theft and, and multi-factor bypasses and a lot of the things that are going on today. It, it's in, in very cliche, but, you know, art of war, right? It's, um, you really need to understand your adversary in order to be very effective in what you're doing. And um, that, that was kind of a personal challenge of mine along the way. I've, I've tried to learn as much as I can on both sides of the fence to become, um, you know, more of an expert practitioner, being able to be better on defense because I understand what the uh, what the adversaries are doing, what they're looking for, how they're trying to monetize my data or my access in my environments. Um, very uh, very excited to talk to Noah. You know, very excited and interested to see his journey. I think it's going to be a lot different from ours. Um, you know, kind of growing up in this field, we didn't have the luxury of uh, YouTube videos, the online documentation. Um, uh, cloud-based uh, uh, classes, on and on and on. You wanted to go learn something, you had to pick up a manual. Um, you know, it was, well, I was a. Reading, uh, I was reading RFCs. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is uh, this is what we had to do. But um, you know, the the it's it's not just the access to uh, all of that. It, the uh, speed of the speed by which technology is changing. Um, makes things uh, much, much tougher. I would say the half-life of the knowledge that Noah is expected to learn and master is, is much shorter than what we had. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, operating systems change much more frequently. The, the, the speed and evolution of applications technology um, and what you were talking about, Tony, how things are kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, but the, the sheer complexity um, compared to where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, is, is amazing to me. All of our data used to be inside of our buildings. 80 to 90 percent of our compute never left our walls. Um, you know, maybe one or a handful of Internet connections for a large enterprise and everything else was private. And today it's it's spread in, in cloud providers and people's homes and all over the world. It's um a uh, much taller task, uh, a lot more doors and windows to protect. And, um, you know, Noah, you know, excited to see your journey, um, excited to be a, a, a part of this and, and certainly uh, to help you kind of steer the ship uh, throughout the course of the year. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, so just to give everybody kind of an intro about me and my background, like Tony said, I'm one of the front end engineers here at Horizon 3, building that awesome portal uh, that all our customers use. But besides that, besides being a front end engineer, I also teach full stack web development at the UNC Coding Bootcamp, uh, University of Chapel Hill. So that's kind of some of my background. I recently just started getting into security. I hang out with all of these awesome guys who they show up, they kick down the door, they take what they want and they leave. And I was like, I want to do that. That's cool. Um, and so that was kind of the first thing that got me interested. I started trying some of the interviews at work uh, just for fun. And then, you know, succeeding at them, seeing how they're challenging, how they're different, they require a different mindset. And the one thing that I've learned so far, and we can talk about all these things, um, is the creativity and security, offensive, defensive, it really isn't just follow these steps and you're secure. It's like, be creative. Can I, you know, craft a special string and send that packet and it travels down the wire all through the code, all the way down to, you know, like a logging utility and then an exploit pops up. So I've really enjoyed learning all of that. That's really awesome. That's kind of what I'm digging into. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. Um, I've been doing a lot of different things to kind of get started. If you're kind of one of those people who's sitting here, like, how do you get into hacking? Where do you even start? You know, 
my thing was hack the box. That's really the best place it's, it's held my hand along the way. I'm a front end engineer, so I really am big on nice front ends. They need to be pretty, have a nice UI, easy. And it's, it's just been awesome. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope that y'all will enjoy this journey as well. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit on me. Good. Noah, Noah, why? So, you know, for front, front end developer, right. Kind of have your, your niche in the world, um, de- developing UI, um, why offense, you know, or, or even, you know, what, why transition? I, I grew up in an era where you were, uh, you're either infrastructure or you were development and, and along the way, kind of in corporate America, um, security became its own uh, leg to the stool, so to speak. It became its own um, kind of profession w- within the realm, separate from the other two. But it's, it's not terribly often that you see p- people move, um, you know, kind of between the three. You know, is it just the, uh, the folks you're working with? Is it the, um, is, is Tony put it offset? curious um or you know i i'd like to say this and, and people always get a kick out of it um s- security is sexy right like it's there's espionage and breaking into things and you know the adrenaline rush of it, it it's pretty cool getting something to do something that it shouldn't or gaining access to something but for, for you what was it that really made you kind of step out um into this new area yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, it's really a culmination of all of it. Like, it's really awesome when I get a reverse shell and I've owned that server and I can go in, I can do whatever I want. I can take your database, I can dump it. I can do anything I want that's malicious. And uh, that's, that's kind of a thrill. And I'm at least doing it legally. And I'm helping serve a greater good and protecting, you know, America one line of code at a time, if you will. Uh, but additionally, it's also, I like to learn. I think us as developers, practitioners, IT professionals, we all want to learn, get better at our skills and our crafts. And so we should be well-versed in all of the different areas. I never thought of security before I came to Horizon 3. I worked for other companies where we even had pen tests. We would hire an outside company, come pen test the web app. And they would give us a report and like, okay, what do we do? It's just security, like that's not gonna happen. But it really does. And I'm, I'm slowly learning like, this is causing a lot of big changes and shifts in the world, whether it's the colonial pipeline hack and shutting down gas reserves, uh, anything. So I think it's really big, I wanna learn. Um, I think it's an awesome, cool skill to grab. And overall, it just helps you be a better IT professional, no matter what you're in. You know, you, you mentioned something that I think is, is kind of critical to your journey. Um, you, you mentioned that you'd like to learn. And, um, you know, I've, I've done this for a long time, as, as have these guys. You expect that you're never going to stop learning. I expect that even with two decades under your belt, there are times you're going to feel like an imposter. Um, you know, I, uh, with, with the pandemic, I took some, took some time, you know, here, I, you know, I, I've got a bunch of certifications an undergrad an MBA. I've, I was a CISO at a fortune 500 pandemic hits. And I went out and got six certifications. There were new things that I, I were trying to pursue things that I was trying to, uh, to learn, um, and, uh, uh, even today, um, you know, I've spent some time, uh, over the past couple of weeks working on a MITRE attack defender, a, a new set of certifications around, uh, the, the, uh, MITRE attack framework that I think will help me understand a little bit more, um, how to defend from, uh, a tactics and techniques, uh, perspective, um, cloud, you, you know, cloud wasn't around 20, 30 years ago, right? At least not as it is now, you know, trying to spend time learning a GCP, Azure, AWS, you know, I, I need to understand how they operate. Um, uh, what are the levers and buttons to be able to protect those environments for, for customers? You know, I, I can't just stick my head in the sand, nor will you, you know, there, there will be things that uh, you're going to have to pick up and you know, attacking a, you know, a, a six-year-old Linux system is very different for, you know, how to, how to bypass multi-factor authentication to get into a mailbox, right? It's, um, there are uh, a lot of new technologies, uh, new ways to defend, 
Um, it, this is a, uh, a, a, you're going to, to be in a position where you're going to be learning for the rest of your career. Um, you, you need to like it. You need to enjoy it. You need to be comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, and I, I think that is uh, uh, critical. I, I think we'd all agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's no matter what you're learning, if you're learning, you know, how to do programming, how to build a server, an API, front end, whatever, uh, it's hard. Everybody starts at some point. Nobody was born an OSCP expert, right? You all worked to this journey and, you know, kept working at it. So I, I think that's really good. And I, I agree. Um, I have a question for you. I guess my first question is, as I've been going into this journey, it's like, how do how, what are the basic skills you need to be a hacker? Like what, what's the kind of, you know, common things you do every day? What skills do you need? That's a, a, a great question. And I, I want to hear, I'd love to hear what Tony has to say about this too, but I, I would say, um, you know, m most of the best and brightest that I've worked with in security, they, they understand a good bit of everything. They understand database, database architecture. They understand, um, you know, SQL query language. They understand how web architecture is configured, works generally. Um, they understand networking, incredibly important. You know, IP addresses, how, how uh, data traverses networks, how it gets out to the internet, um, you know, fundamentals of security technologies, you know, endpoint, EDR, antivirus, uh, intrusion prevention, firewalls. Essentially you know, everything. Yeah, I, you really need to have a, a wide base of understanding and, and you know, in, in your kind of world, like, you know, in the development world, you've probably bumped into a lot of these things, but having a deeper understanding of all of it is going to make you a better security practitioner. On the, defense, on the defensive side, on why that's important, you need to know what those buttons and levers are that you can do to implement controls system-wide, application-wide, network-wide, right? What, what are the capabilities that I have in here to secure my systems? And on the offensive side, what might I bump into or what might I be able to use to my advantage to get into a system, right? Um, so, you, you know, that, um, that for me, just that like wide breadth of knowledge, um, you, you don't need to be an expert over everything. Um, you, you know, but understanding many of the domains um, pretty broadly is very, very helpful. Yeah. I 100% agree uh, with everything you said. It was, it's interesting that you brought up as a defender, the knobs and levers within all of these systems. Most of the time that falls on system administrators, site reliability engineers, and the people who are deploying these things. And in most organizations, IT operations and all of those things are completely separate and they're always in, in this conflict. I've always felt that if you understand the OSI model very deeply and you can apply it to practicality and, and what's actually going on in all of these different systems and servers, services and applications, it's, it makes you, a, it, the, the, the migration from IT operations and deploying things to understanding how to attack it and defend it becomes much, much easier. And when I say much easier, I use that very lightly because it's, it's, not, it's not easy. There's a lot to figure out and a lot of different pieces and components of it. Uh, one of the things that, uh, um, that came to me while I was in the service was, hey, we're going to stand up this new offensive um, the, they were the one Bravo fours and they were the air forces, offensive security folks. Um, and they would go through a course and all that. And they came to me at the schoolhouse and they asked, well, what are the things that should be the prerequisites? And can we take people off the streets who know nothing, you know, in the service, you go from, you know, right out of high school, most of the time, or maybe you got some college and then you go in uh, to be an enlisted member. And could you take somebody who knows nothing not even basic understanding of the OSI model. These are kids right out of high school who may or may not have a, you know, a leg up on that and have studied it within high school. And can you turn them into hackers? And I was, uh, I was against that. I thought it made much more sense to migrate folks who were in IT operations, my career field and some of the other career fields around me who had that base level of knowledge and migrate them into that because now not only do they know, they have an understanding of, um, do they have an understanding of IT operations and how systems are deployed within the service and, you know, how Air Force deploys technology, but you also have an understanding of 
the people and the things that will get missed and the shortcuts that get taken when pressure is on and we have to move fast and how do we do those things so i completely agree with what you're saying and i'll tell you as uh not a gray beard logic and instructions and understanding that which is why noah as a developer is the right guy here because noah you're creating the rules the logic and instruction of the rules and if you know those you know how to get around them so noah if you wouldn't mind diving into a little bit of some of your first steps that you've created on how to run an attack and what you've discovered i think you've got something you wanted to show the everybody dialed in for this here yeah yeah absolutely let me go ahead and share my screen so you should be able to take a look here you should see that i'm on, first on hack the box i love this application i don't know how tony and chris and all of y'all did it without hack the box it makes <laughs> my life easy if you haven't tried it go sign up we're not partnered with them or anything i just really love learning from here um I'm working on my hacker name. That's one of the fun things. Um, my name, at least, was Mr. Sandman, but you know, I'm always coming up with different names. Uh, but here's my profile. I started out just like, what's this hack the box? Let me sign up. Let me take a look around. The one thing I would recommend if you're curious about security, you want to hack something um, without being in trouble, of course, this is all legal. Hack the box is great. Go to the starting point, sign up, do a thing, a free trial. I've went through all of these boxes. I went through, uh, you know, tier zero. Those are super easy. They have nice walkthroughs uh, that you can download and it'll even tell you all the steps and the commands to do. And that's really what helped me was the walkthroughs. As I started going through and progressing into the different tiers, doing very easy boxes, I started moving on up to easy boxes. Um, so there's different ones and they all have different infrastructure, uh, vulnerabilities. They're really awesome to try out. So that's kind of the first thing that I, I really have loved and enjoyed. Um, and slowly as you progress, they, they've gamified this all, you know, you can see here, I am now officially a script kitty. I just <laughs> got that rank, right? So I wasn't even a script. Congratulations. Kitty, but yeah, I'm happy to be a script kitty. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the first thing. Now, the other thing I was going to talk about is as I was going through Hack the Box, one that really stuck out to me was Log for Shell because it was really big. It came out in December. Um, you know, Chris and Tony, feel free to chime in. But from what I understand, it was found in Minecraft or at least zero day there announced. And it was a way for people to take control just through a logging utility package. Uh, is that kind of, am I getting it right there? Yeah, it, the, um, yeah, in, in the, uh, the so it's a, a library that was utilized by uh, a lot of applications, platforms, um, where if you, um, you know, were able to send a command kind of through the, uh, the logging library, you could elicit uh, commands um, including uh, catching a reverse shell or, or executing uh, an outbound shell, um, you know, very, uh, uh, very critical, um, you know, and, and widely used. So a, a lot of organizations that uh, have developed software, developed applications, solutions uh, may have been utilizing this unbeknownst to themselves. Um, you know, they, still many organizations are, are trying to figure out um, a software bill of material. You know, is this inside their own applications, their own solutions that they've sold to customers? Um, but, uh, you know, widely seen and uh, um, I, I would say the global IT security community has spent uh, the last two months trying to figure out, um, you know, if, if uh, where the issues are and how to remediate them. Yeah. yeah, it's and if we get you know down into the tech a little bit more of it, it's when 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 people write their logging instead of having to fill in all the variables of uh, what's being logged, log for J allowed you to bring uh, variables in and be able to kick that information out. So you can put in uh, this is the timestamp or this is some specific thing that is represented by a variable within this log entry. And you can call out to different services from that log entry and bring more information to enrich your log so that you have a better understanding of what's going on, a little bit more verbosity. 
and it allowed you allowed an attacker to leverage those services uh, within a log. And if you don't uh, protect the log entries or you don't protect the inputs the proper way, it will allow you to inject commands into the actual log. And I think, no, that's what, that's the one you did, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yep. to kind of give you all some background, I, I did the log for shell exploit on Hack the Box and I said, let me recreate this in the wild. Let me just go see if I can make it all from scratch. And you know, it gets down into something like this type of code. Get a logger, log an error. An error was console logged into your log, um, you know, your logging utilities. And so what I've done is actually I, I the box I believe that is log for shell vulnerable, if you want to try it out, is unified on hack the box. So I started there, I learned that. The next things though that I did is I said, I want to make my own. I want to exploit it. I want to make it all from scratch. So I went out to Linode, just kind of spun up a couple of servers, right? I have a website here. This is my, my front end website. It uses JSP Wiki. So it's Java on the back end. There's some HTML, CSS, and everything on the front end, but it's vulnerable to log for shell. And so that's what I really want to kind of give you all a little bit of a glimpse into. And if you want to know all the commands and everything, I can provide a write up for all of the steps. But the first thing was to do is kind of set up a website. Let's just imagine this is any website out there in the world. You know, this, this exploit is going on every day is from what I've gathered. There, there's bad actors going out there, spraying and praying. Hopefully this is vulnerable to log for shell. Let me just, let me try. There's not much work to do it, to exploit it. And so what you might see is, okay, we have this website here. I could look in the source code. I could look through it. I could try those things, but maybe I don't have their source code. It really just depends. Um, but I say, you know what? There's a search bar here, right? I could, I could search for something. I could write a specially crafted string. It sends down the wire to the backend, the API, and then maybe that logger is going to log it. And maybe it's going to kick off some more code. It's going to execute something. And so it's very simple. I just find the input. And then the other thing that I need to do is I just need to have a, a, a server. I went and I provisioned, provisioned my own server. It's malicious. It's a bad server. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I have a command that starts up my bad server and it's running. It's ready to exploit something. Um, I'm also going to set up a netcat listener. This is just letting me get those reverse shells that, you know, Chris, you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So netcat, LVMP, a couple of, you know, flags and everything. I'm just going to run it on port 444. And then if I take this, I'm just going to put it all here side by side. We have the front end here. We have the server. And then hopefully we're going to get access to the server over here. So you'll see it travel through the wire. Now, how do I do it? What is, what is the specially crafted string? Well, I, I use double quotes to at least protect it and encapsulate it as it's traveling through the wire. And then um, some of the syntax is just Java. Do a JNDI lookup to LDAP. And Chris, if you know you want to provide any additional flavor on JNDI or LDAP, feel free. Uh, but let me just finish this real quick. Uh, 192, 168, 139, 52. Mm -hmm. And then it's on port 1389. And then the URL that we're going to hit up is output equals Tomcat. If I hit find, I got a connection. My reverse shell came in. What do I, what can I do here? Um, so let's see. I can type most basic. Who am I? I'm root. I just rooted this box. I have it, it's mine. Uh, what do I do now? Uh, the first thing that I would at least do is just kind of upgrade the terminal, make it a little bit better. And then I start looking around. I start poking into the server. We got some, some backup logs. I'm in the home directory. I see that there's a Dinesh user, there's a Gilfoil. Maybe I start looking in Dinesh. There's nothing in there. Maybe I go into, uh, you know, Gilfoil, sorry, one of my fingers, I cut it the other night when I was cooking. So my typing is a little, little off, but there you go. You can see, let me clear this terminal out just to make it look nice. Well, I can't clear, but um, I have a flag. I could 
cat that flag and I can see I got some sensitive data capture the flag that's all that hack the box is it's a lot of go find this file go capture it or in another case maybe a little more real world cat the passwords txt the username is Gilfoil, and there's his password to log in maybe I pivot Maybe I go to another server. Maybe I try to use his credential to get in. So that's kind of what I've I built and wanted to showcase. Uh, Tony, Chris, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's 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 really cool. To, one for you to walk through this and and see how you've kind of figured this out by using you know the walkthroughs that are out there, and then being able from your seat as a front end developer and understanding full stack how to actually set this up, and then you know, actually do the exploitation and be able to explain it and understand it. What that now allows you to do is take that information and now, okay, cool. Now, how do I defend against this? How do I, as I'm developing things, how do I turn this into ways? And, you know, uh, Mark just posted in there, lesson learned, don't let your host communicate outbound on strange ports. <laughs> absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Now, what he says that's cool. That's one defensive mechanism to, to stop one thing. But he also adds encrypt netcat listener over 443, right? So thinking about what are the services that are going out? No, this, no, Mark, you're, you're spot on, man. You're spot on. This is this cat and mouse game between how offensive security works and how defense, uh, how defense adjusts to it. And then offense then takes their next steps of, okay, cool. They've added this new TTP. To stop that, how am I going to get around it? Well, we just now we start tunneling, uh, tunneling over different protocols that I know are going to be allowed out. Okay, so what do they do now? They're going to put in proxies. All right, cool. How do I get around a proxy? I find a host that's allowed out. Do I wrap that in something else? Uh, we start using uh, command and control systems through LinkedIn or through uh, Craigslist or something like that. You know what I mean? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, the um, you know I think uh, great great things to learn on both sides, and you know as a, as a developer, wow, you know if I put if I just build something off of somebody else's technology uh, and deploy it, and, and you know whether you are Netflix or uh, fly by the seat of your pants company, uh, whomever, right? You know th this could bury you in uh, um, uh, in, in, from a security perspective pretty easily. You know, from the developer side of things, right? Input validation, super important control, right? Well, you, you know, putting things in quotations, right? And in opportunity get to get around potentially some kind of input validation. Um, the uh, um, Tony, what you were talking about with uh, outbound filtering, why why is a server if this is hosted anywhere, is it allowed to initiate a conversation with anything around the globe? It should be inbound communication only to begin with. Why is your web server running with root credentials, right? Um, you know, on and on and on. It is this cat and mouse game, but you know, from a, a defensive perspective, right? Some, you know, I, I work at a company. Somebody comes to me and they've got a new web app that they want to deploy. Okay, put it on a server and go, and I'll open this port. Um, but you know, whether whether you're in security or a developer or a sysadmin or a network person, understanding security from all of these different points of view can make you better. Um, you know, what, what I've often, often said is, is a security leader inside large corporations was, I can't stand behind every employee and tell them what to click on and what not to click, click on. I really needed the culture of the organization, organization to be one such that everybody took personal responsibility for the security of the company. You know, if you were a clerk, if you were an analyst, if you were, um, you, you know, whomever within the organization, if you saw something odd or, or you knew better, you, you know, let somebody know. Um, you know, if you're a sysadmin, keep your, your systems up to date and patched. If you're a developer, think about input validation, think about how to protect things, think about how attackers operate and, and maybe being able to use your application to, to steal data um, harvest credentials, uh, otherwise cause the organization harm. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is all about data protection. It, it, it's most simplest, right? Uh, attackers are trying to monetize data, albeit credentials or, or sensitive information, trademark data, intellectual property, credit card numbers, PII, whatever the case, right? Trying to make money off of it. 
um, we, we all have an obligation to, uh, to do what we can to protect it. And, and here you see a number of ways which any one of which could have stopped this attack, right? Um, but you know, having a layered approach to it is, is going to end up with a, a better, uh, better certainty in, uh, in protecting data. Um, no, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect segue for us to kind of close the loop on this is the intent of these is to provide more understanding of what's going on on the offensive side and how attackers are looking at our environments and our code and our architectures and our implementations so that we can start to take more responsibility for it and go, hmm, I just went to Stack Overflow and I found this really cool function that does this, but is this how I should be implementing this? I don't know how many times I have found like the the the, the Django debug uh, Django debug is turned on and people build these applications. Just oh, that's how Stack Overflow said I should do it, and they drop it in there. I would really like for folks on Stack Overflow to start to implement. Oh yeah, this is the default. Don't use this. Make sure you turn this off. Now I know Django has the big warning that pops up. Debug is on and all that, but you know we can start to take more responsibility for it as. Uh, as on the operation side, the de uh, research and development side to kind of make things more secure, defensible by design. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, just to add real quick, <laughs> um, the one last thing I would say that, that I kind of learned was, you know, just an if statement. If I don't write a strong if statement, I'm destroyed all over an if statement. So that's the big connection for me as a developer. I'm like, aha, oh, if somebody's looking at my code and they say, oh, well, if your role is admin, I'll just make my role admin or I'll you know, do what I can to bypass that. You, you gotta write defensive code and you gotta do all these practices too that they talked about. So yeah, awesome. That is a great way to close it out, Noah, on that particular note, what you learn going forward. So Noah, can you give us a little insight into what you want to do next in this next series? We're looking at this uh, next month, uh, about six weeks. We'll see what time when we can pull you off developing for the company and actually do some of this here. But what do you want to hit next? What's the next evolutionary step for you and your journey that you see coming up? And yeah. Graybeards, what do you recommend for Noah next coming up? Yeah, so I'll go first. Um, I, I at least have this natural ability to web. I'm a web developer, full stack, front end, server, database. I'm naturally comfortable there. I was thinking what might be cool is we do some web app exploits, such as like a SQL injection. Let me inject some malicious code and dump your database, steal all your users, do all, take all your industry data. That's kind of what I was kind of leaning towards, but I'd be curious, Tony and Chris, what you have. Mm, that's a that's a fun one. There are so many different ways you could go with it. I would like to see you get into chaining multiple things together and understanding how one piece of exploitation only gets you so far. And it's about how do you leverage that and maybe go into a little bit more post-exploitation maybe. Chris, what do you think? I would, uh, I'd love to take you out of your comfort zone and see you uh, working in Active Directory. Um, you know, being able to uh, understand Active Directory, how to attack it, e either uh, via Kerberos or, or um, you know, their uh, uh, silver silver Bloodhound. ticket. Yeah, but Bloodhound, good uh, good good tool. Um, but you know, that that is kind of the the core for identity. Identity is the the new perimeter. Um, for every organization, you know, really under the sun, everybody's running Active Directory internally. Many people are, are afraid of securing it. Um, it's hard. It's running. No one wants to tip things over. O ops is usually Flex. really trying to focus on availability rather than security and uh, um, critical piece of infrastructure that I, I think it's under. It's very, very important to understand how to attack, but how to defend. I like that one too. So just as uh, Luke Skywalker started his journey and he had his Obi-Wan going along, you always need a hand solo there going, don't get cocky, kid. So uh, just as you get started, as you can see, you've got a lot of ways this can go forward. So this is cool. I, I love that we're going to be on this journey with you, Noah. And I'll tell you what, can't wait 
for everybody who got to join us here. Uh, thank you very much for getting to spend the last 45 minutes with us. As always, if you have any further questions and you want to bring them over, even to ask Noah about a couple of the things, send them to customer.success at horizon3.ai, customer.success at horizon3.ai, and we'll make sure Noah gets those. Reach out to us anytime if you've got any other comments, any other Q&A for us, and we'll make sure that we've got some real good uh, follow-up for you here. On that note, Tony, my CTO, you got anything to bring us home here, brother? I do. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to the next ones with you. And I'm really glad that we partnered up with you and, and MRK. Uh, Noah, I'm excited to see how this goes. Remember, you still got a day job. So what uh, we got a, uh, we're, we're looking at a bunch of new pieces to this. So looking at Noah building out a blog to kind of follow his journey on that side of it to get a little bit more details. And then also probably a Twitch stream. We're talking about setting up a Twitch stream and having some of our attack engineers, Naveen and Zach and the team jumping in and helping him out, hacking through some things and learning some stuffs. And then maybe as uh, uh, Chris and, and some of our other partners want to jump in and help him out with that and, uh, and doing that. I really appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, tell your friends, tell your, your dev friends, your SRE friends uh, that we're doing these on a regular basis and, and send us our feedback. Uh, let us know what you think we would we should do better. We, we're making these for you guys. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.